Well, I have to say I'm very excited about recording this particular video today because it touches on a topic that is very hot right now, especially in the entrepreneurial community, and that is on the topic of mentorship. But the reason I'm so excited for this video is because of what is known as the processional effect. Now, we've all had times where we've gone and done something and it's had uh, consequences, whether they've been unintended consequences or you know, something that's led to something else, usually for the greater good in this context. And so a processional effect is something that, you know, the, the lead domino that you can flick and it has you know, consequences all the way down the line, ripples of contribution as I like to call it. And how that relates to this particular video is because I have one of my mentees with me here, which is Nick. And uh, Nick has been with me for you know, a couple of years now. He's been an incredible student. And what's unique about this, he's also brought one of his mentees in, which is Conrad. And so you kind of get the three different levels of, or generations of mentorship. And so we thought it would be really fun to shoot a video to explore the dynamics around that and see the different perspectives on you know, mentor, mentee, and mentee of mentee, as it were, and mentee becoming mentor. And you know, really just have a, a conversation about that, guys, as to you know, what are the things that we can share with the audience that you know, they can learn or get some insights from having you know, sort of put that dynamic together and gone through that journey. Uh, so, uh, Nick, Obviously, you know, with you and I having the relationship, well, what's something that you would share with the audience that would be, you know, uh, an insight around, you know, what what prompted you to, you know, want a mentor? Mm -hmm. What's your story with regards to, you know, the, your journey through that? And what are some of the insights around, you know, the relationship and our relationship that uh, have really sort of impacted you? That mm -hmm. also helped you sort of take that journey to the next step and become a mentor yourself? Yeah, well, a fantastic question. I think. If I look back through my life before uh, I was working with you, I noticed that I naturally aligned to mentors, although I didn't have a framework of understanding for how that mentor-mentee relationship would work. So I had the opportunity to learn from some wonderful people, but never really got the most from the relationship because I wasn't really aware of what I was a part of, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and then when we started working together, as the best things in life do, it kind of naturally happened, it just occurred. And if I'm being honest, in the early stages, I really didn't understand the dynamic of the relationship. I didn't know what I was supposed to bring to the table. I didn't know whether I was asking too much of you if I needed advice or support. So it was confusing one at the start, <laughs> to say the least. But I think one of the, the, the biggest lessons that I learned early on with this, and one of the, the key things that you taught me, um, was that a mentor should be like a good friend. Not like somebody that you put on a pedestal and worship and praise and look up to. Because if they do, you're always going to be less and they can never fulfill their goal of, of bringing you, you know, to the level they want to. And I remember, if, if I can share a, a short story, I remember when that lesson hit me. And I was, of course, as well as being mentored by you, I was your sales director as well as you remember. And we had had a particularly rough week in sales. And I was feeling very much like I was under pressure. We had a conversation. It was a G-up conversation, you know, to, to kind of make sure that I was okay, I think. <laughs> and um, I went into it and I just started justifying. I started explaining to you, oh, well, I've been doing this, I've been making this many calls, and I've been banging my head against the wall in this number of different ways. And none of that hit you. It kind of all washed straight through because you'd seen something far deeper that needed to be addressed. You know, these details were just details and decorations of a conversation. That's all they were. And you said to me in that moment, you said, Nick, you're good enough. Why are you seeking validation from me? Why are you seeking approval from me? You don't need to. You're in the position you're in because you've earned the right to be in that position. And something very interesting happened in that very moment is the way that I perceived our relationship went from you on a pedestal up here and me looking up in awe to us being on a level playing field, to there being this mutual amount of respect between each other. And then at that stage when there was that level playing field, all of a sudden, this beautiful thing was born because the relationship can really take its place then because the exchange is far far more appropriate it's on a level playing field and you know the greatest thing that you taught me so to bring summary to that story was that I didn't need you you were an enhancement mm. you know I was a force when I was working with you but I didn't need you you were not a crutch yep. to me and that was one of the most powerful things and it you know for, for me you know my, my respect for you increased because I realized, because again, in the early stages, I wondered what your motive, why does this guy just want to help me? <laughs> Where's that coming from? Because we live in such a transactional world, don't we? That why does he just want to help? And in that moment, I realized your complete disattachment to ego when working with me. 
because it wasn't about you. It was never about you. It was about me and where you could guide me to. So, yeah, that's probably the early stages of getting into mentorship with you and one of the, the big early lessons that I took from you. Excellent. And mm. uh, um, one of the things it really sort of brings out and enhances here, guys, is that uh, most leaders, especially in politics, are trying to um, justify or validate their level of leadership by the amount of followers that they attract. Whereas real leadership, if you study through history, the people that have really made the difference for the greater good and have shaped the reality that we now have the privilege of living in, have really done so as leaders by creating more leaders. Yeah, I validate leadership by the amount of leaders that you know, other people are able to create. And it's almost the same as if you go to school. You, know, you have two types of teachers in school, and I've, you know, I've been very vocal about me getting out of school at 16 because I didn't fit the academic profile. But I've been blessed enough to be able to be invited back on the board of some of the, you know, the most prestigious business schools in, uh, in, in the world. And what I noticed going back into that environment, looking at it from an entrepreneur's perspective, having been, you know, gone through many years of experience at that point, was that the two types of teachers, and you could apply this to the mentorship in what you've just said, uh, you know, there's those teachers who are using the role, the label, the position of teacher to enhance their ego. Mm. Now, I have the answers, therefore you should listen. Mm. Yeah? My role is teacher, your role is student, so stay there. Right? And it's the, 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 the whole subtext is I'm more important, more special, more significant, better than you are because I've earned my way up. And that's just you know, a level of emotional maturity on the journey that just you know, needs to progress. But then you get those rare teachers, you know, the ones we really remember, the ones who you know, understand that the role of every teacher is you know, really for their students to excel them because everything other than that is ego. And that's what I try to bring into the mentorship level of relationship. You know, what am I here? Do I, need, I, do I need to validate myself as a mentor by how many mentees I have and what they do? <laughs> Give me a break. Mm. If I need that, then I shouldn't be in the game. Yes. I should be listening to my mentors mm -hmm. yeah, and understanding that, uh, yeah, that I still have a lot of, uh, long way to go on my journey. Yeah, mm. and, yeah, and I'm sure we'll get into the whole process of, of, of it being about the journey, not the destination. But you know, from, from, from that side, you know, it's a case of how can I contribute, how can I pass on? Uh, how can I help this person stand on the shoulders uh, uh, of myself so that they can reach taller? Why? Because I'm blessed to be who I am because I've had the privilege of standing on the shoulders of giants myself. Mm -hmm. And when we come from that place, yeah, it has a whole different dynamic to, oh, well, you know, I'm the mentor, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, you know uh, and, uh, and, and you see a lot of that goes on. Yeah. Uh, now, I'm not saying one's wrong, one's right. I'm saying, from my perspective, the more evolved level of mentorship is the one where you're not there to give advice because you have all of the, you know, the answers. It's how do I look into the soul of this person? How do I really see what's going on? And what I saw with you on that particular example, Nick, uh, and this is a really interesting dynamic that again, um, I'm gonna invite you to really sort of peel back the layers of the onion for, and is that's to spot the difference between behavior and patterns. See, I didn't care what was coming out of Nick's mouth. You know, I see a lot more than what comes out of people's mouths. Yeah, what I was looking for, what are the patterns that are driving it? Yeah, and he could have got into the whole aspect of, oh, you know, I, I, I want to, you know, uh, uh, I should have done this, but I was doing that, and, you know, uh, yeah, I, I could have made these sales, but this didn't happen, and, you know, I tried really hard. Yeah, noise, it's mm. all noise. Mm. What's driving that? The underlying pattern that's driving that is that I need to prove myself worthy in this situation so that I can avoid criticism and validate myself yes. in the eyes of my mentor that Some I'm looking sense. to gain respect from. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, true. And so when you address that, if I can get rid of that, yeah, yeah. all of the other conversation doesn't happen. Yeah. It doesn't need to. Yeah. It's like going to a chiropractor. Yeah, you go to a chiropractor because you've got different you know, things out of alignment and they make one adjustment at the top of the spine and everything else falls mm. into place. So working with patterns of behavior is far more powerful than trying to deal with the surface stuff. And I'll give one final example on that, and then I want to, I'm keen to have you know, some more insight from you and your relationship with Connor. Mm -hmm. But you know, if, you know, if you're coming from uh, a place of uh, trying, to, trying to fix things, you know, if you're coming from a place of looking at the, the, the surface level of understanding, mm -hmm. yeah, then you're always going to be distracted by the immediacy of the problem. Yeah. Uh, and you go to the, you know, look at back in history at the wise, you know, people, whether it's the Mahatma Gandhis of the world, whether the Nelson Mandela, nothing seemed to phase them. Because they were always coming from a place above the noise. Yeah. 
they were looking above the drama of the inherent like immediacy of, of you know all, all of the challenge uh, that was going on uh, and so you know my, my role really was to be able to support you in being able to get rid of that level of you know sort of uh, low level noise mm. that distracts us so often and see how can I you know my intention how can I really serve this person mm. yeah and some people have their own way of being able to do that mm. yeah is it to yeah slap them yeah is it to encourage them is it to you know sort of fix their issues and yeah you know, everyone's got their own stuff but for me it's how can I allow this person to spot their own levels of um, uh, opportunities for growth and then invite them on that path so mm. that they see that I am not the answer. Yeah. If they think I'm the answer, I'm in trouble. Yeah. That's called designing yourself into the equation. <laughs> okay? And not only is that, you know, a, uh, again, an egocentric level of, of approach, uh, but does nothing to enhance your ability to be self-sufficient. Mm. Yeah. yeah. How do I teach you how to fish? Uh, how do I, you know, uh, uh, essentially, allow you to spot the fact that you and your own greatness is all that you need mm. and if I'm lucky enough to have been chosen through whatever serendipitous circumstances that presented themselves to be able to hold up a mirror for you to be able to recognize your own greatness my entire role as a mentor is for you to get clear on that reflection mm, I like that. and from that place we can work mm. yeah, because all I'm showing you is the same level of greatness that I see in myself mm. that I see in others then you have a level playing field. Yeah. Then there's no like, oh well, you know, here's me because I've done this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a, a relationship to a mentor is healthy when you, know, you can you can clear that fog away in the mirror, and you don't say, oh my God, they're there. You, I mean, a mentorship relationship, guys, is about having a a level of connection with somebody who has more experience than you that you can yeah. benefit from that experience. And yeah, not from a dysfunctional relationship where you think you need someone with experience to fix your problems. Yes. Yeah? yes. Makes sense? Yes. Uh, and sense. you've been an, an amazing example of that and being able to take that on board and being able to blossom in your own life now in so many different ways. Yeah, I see no neediness in you. No, no, no more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no I see no begging for approval or answers or anything. And, and it's so refreshing because the need for approval is such a cancer to the human psyche. It really is. It's such a... Uh, you know, a thief of potential yeah, and greatness. So, you know, when you can get out of the good opinion of other people, when you can break that addiction, uh, you can take a breath and start, you know, really looking at what your life issues are and reflections. And again, you've been a great example. Thank you. Thank you. So, when it comes to passing the torch mm -hmm. and that processional effect and that contribution, as it were, tell me about this guy. Yeah. Wow. Where do we start? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Give me a story. Yeah, so the, the very first time we met each other, uh, it was the business school, Sage Business School last year, uh, the middle of the year event, and I was of course running the in-house uh, sales and support team, and this chap, uh, after actually speaking on stage, and, and I remember he spoke, he said something on stage, beautiful words, he's, he's a wonderful writer, um, and he came up to me and he said, hey, you know, I, I really want to work with you, really want to work with your team, and I want to be mentored by you. I was so busy, because we were a team of 12 supporting 400 guests. So I'm like, yeah, dude, sounds amazing, love that, come and see me in a bit. Seven attempts later, and I'm saying the same thing to him. <laughs> but something that hit me immediately, he was persistent, but I was happy to see him every time. He wasn't doing it in a petulant way. You understand what I mean? He was, there was authenticity behind it. And um, eventually, yeah, we exchanged numbers and we spoke on the phone and... and um, yeah, I invited him to, to do a trial with us. We then obviously established a trial office in Tenerife, if you recall, last uh, November, where we were going to open the office here. So the first thing I invited him to is, hey, yeah, it'd be great for you to work with us. Uh, do you fancy coming to Tenerife for a, a working holiday for the next two weeks? It's winter in Pond, freezing, <laughs> raining, let me, and just Let me take the awful. skis off, and I'm sure that will be good, Nick, yeah. <laughs> Um, but, but yeah, so then, then he came over in those two weeks. He was the top-ranking salesperson and the people that he made sales to have gone on to be friends of his so it says something about the way he operates um, and then you know obviously I, I was living in Tenerife at that point and then I get a call from him in December going hey dude any chance I can stay at your house for a few days in January because we just booked flights over there to move there and I need to find accommodation when I land I was like I rate this guy the ability he, to handle uncertainty oh like <laughs> absolutely hit it out of the park and then he arrived and we started working with each other and we'll dig more into that now but um 
I think, you know, we, we, I, we're talking here about me being a mentor to Comrade, and I think from a professional perspective that certainly is true because I've you know, done a decade in the City of London, I, I've done all these things, I have good value to pass on, but I'm somebody who had, let me call it a spiritual awakening, let's say, only 18 months, a couple of years ago, I had no access to anything spirituality in my, spiritual in my life before then. This is uh, somebody who's had that awakening far earlier, so I believe the relationship is somewhat symbiotic because from the spiritual perspective, you know, I learn and garner a lot from him. He is my reason. That's that's how I see him. Um, so it's, it's so it's nice in that way. But um, that's how we met. That's how we brought on. And I tell you what, I really enjoyed is I've always felt that I've always felt there needs to be a two-way exchange of respect when you're working with anybody. You know, I've, I've always felt that, that you get what you give in that respect. You know, if, and Comrade was just somebody who was just very very tuned into that way of thinking as well. He was very, very respectful, he was very, very good, very good. He stands on his own two feet in terms of the fact that he's, you know, if he disagrees, he'll say something. But he is the perfect personification of the saying, you know, uh, a wise man hears advice and says thank you, a fool hears advice and gets unhappy. You know, if, if Comrade hears something that corrects his current belief system, he's delighted. He's full of gratitude that I've he's... I've noticed that about him just in the short time that we've, we've spent here yeah. uh, on that as well. It's, uh, it's, it's a very great you know, character trait. And I remember you saying that the two greatest, you know, the greatest resource, uh, resource is resourcefulness, but, but also one of the greatest attributes that you can have is to be coachable. And I believe that ability to be able to listen to advice without ego and take it and really, you know, scrutinise and then bring it on board if it's right, I believe makes you incredibly coachable. So. Yeah, it's been a pleasure, as you see so far. <laughs> I've put you on a pedestal now. I hope you like it up there. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you then as well. <laughs> uh, and Conrad, what, you know, tell me about the dynamic with Nick, because you know, one of the things we said earlier was the fact that you know, there, there's a, there's, it's not a transactional-based relationship. And the word you used there, Nick, was symbiotic. Mm. Yeah, uh, in other words, that there's give and take. And, and that's, you know, that doesn't come from, again, a horse trading perspective. It comes from a place of, of one plus one is a level. Yeah, so you know, what, what's been your experience in terms of working with Nick? Because the, the, the other point I, I just want to highlight there is you know, something Nick says, you know, your, your ability to own yourself in respect to taking on board advice or you know, insight or criticism you know, that some people could label and being okay with that, but also uh, being willing to challenge you know, to some level, not from a place of conflict, but from a place of expressing truth. Yes. And the challenge I see with a lot of mentees is that they become yeah, enamored by the relationship and essentially become yes men or yes women. Mm. And that's, that's unhealthy because then the mentor themselves has no real feedback yeah, in terms of being able to gauge you know, what, you know, what they're saying. It's just a one way street. And so if you're there being able to take on board everything, yeah, then yeah, this, it, it makes the, the dynamic just a harder work for the mentee because there's, there's very little feedback. Yeah. So what's been your relationship yeah, to Nick, and how did you sort of um, establish, let's say, the unspoken ground rules around him? I think, first of all, Nick helped me with that very, very much because he was always trying to facilitate a relationship where I felt that we are actually equals. And my part of the equation was to accept this. And I think acceptance was probably the most challenging thing. Because if you would be putting me down or trying to keep me in this you know, student, uh, student frame and he's the master, I'm the student, then it's possible that I would, have been just, I would just stay there. Because it would be just difficult, especially that we are working on sales and he has 15 years of experience, I have almost none experience, so I was very new, he was very seasoned, so it would be very, very easy for him to create a frame when I don't know nothing, he knows everything. But yet he was very inviting for me to feel like we were equals. And even though, even then, I felt a lot of tension with this because I saw myself as a student, as the lesser person for some reason. And just being able to stay with this with this resistance and actually accept that it's there and still give some maybe not advice, but give my opinion on whatever topic we'll be talking on and just feel that we are actually can be friends and mm -hmm. <laughs> not only be the student and the master mm -hmm. was probably the biggest thing just to accept that there is this equal relationship there so I feel that if you have a mentor that as you said hasn't stepped into this role mm -hmm. and he tries to validate himself it might be difficult for the both yeah, yeah. mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. so allowing yourself to be led 
but then still taking responsibility for your own path. Because I really came from this place of trying to outsource the responsibility for my life <laughs> to a mentor, a coach, or whoever. And then there was actually a couple of situations when I felt quite resentful, like, why this guy is not taking the responsibility? Well, this wasn't the thoughts I had in my head, but now I can see that this was basically what's going on, what was going on. And again, if you can just stay with that resentment and not judge it, not try to think too much about it, but then just go, go with the flow, just do the next thing and then see how it develops, I feel that oftentimes I just notice that it dissipates. It dissipates and you see the deeper lesson behind it. So what you said before, just trying to be very, very coachable, trying to get feedback, and if your ego just says, no, 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 I have to be right here, <laughs> just stay with it, just stay with it, and it's probably going to develop in the right direction. Mm. Well, I, I can already tell he's an incredible student, yeah, mm -hmm. just on, uh, on that basis. And, and you touch on a really great point there that I want to highlight for, for, the, for the viewers as well. Uh, and that is, uh, you said about you know, resistance. Mm. See, the challenge is when most people come up against um, uh, information and insight, a situation even, circumstance that doesn't fit their pictures, that they don't like, or most commonly threatens their own sense of significance, yeah, threatens their own sense of being right. The ego naturally wants to jump up. And what most people do then is they reach for a sword yeah, to either attack or defend. Yeah, or if they come from a subservient perspective, they may reach for a drink. Yeah, or they may reach for a, uh, an escape route. Mm, yes. Yeah, whereas being able to stand in that space and not be offended, especially when you know the intention behind whatever was delivered was somewhat to serve, uh, then yeah, that's a sign of emotional maturity. That's a sign that you're on the right track. And again, sometimes we don't like hearing what, you know, what needs to be said, but we also need to have the ability to take on board what's relevant. Mm. Um, and again, yeah, I, as Nick knows, I'm, I certainly don't tell him what he wants to hear. No. Right? Sometimes the role of a mentor is to get the pattern and put it in your face and say, excuse me, what, you know, what about this are you not noticing yet? <laughs> you know? And sometimes it's also about, uh, in fact, a lot of the times, it's not about giving the answers. Uh, the answer is the shortcut that cheats you out of growth. Yeah. Yeah, I'll say that again. Providing somebody the answer to something is robbing them of the opportunity to learn. Mm. So. What is the role of a mentor when it comes to that? Because A, you also don't want to see people struggling or in pain, yeah, but you know, no parent wants to see their kid fall down and scrape their knee, but every parent knows that that's required in order for a child to learn you know, how to balance. So you know, if you have a, a situation where you know, you're being asked direct questions, to be able to facilitate their own discovery of the answer is a far more powerful way to mentor somebody and I see that that's happened in, in both of these uh, generations, if you want to call it that. You know, not that I see myself as the grandfather here. So <laughs> not, not at 45 years old, anyway. And, uh, not, not unless my, my, my Jack Russells have, uh, have puppies. But yeah, when it comes to being able to shine a light on their path and mm -hmm. give them the invitation and the encouragement to be able to walk that path. Mm. Not to be able to push them down the path, not to be able to drag them along it, not be able to tell them where they should go but to structure the relationship in a way that invites them to look at what the options are, to ask better questions of themselves, to facilitate answers that would lead them to the correct choice for them, not an imposition of a mentor on you, because that's my model of the world and you're not me. Mm. Yeah, but having that wherewithal to say, you know, to assess the situation, see where the pain is, look at where, you know, it may be very obvious for me just to say, hey, listen, take the left fork in the road, not the right fork in the road. Yeah, but that's not my job, mm. and I have no right to do it. My job is to get you to go within and ask better questions so that you can come to that awareness yourself. And then if there is fear, which a lot of the time there is, that's stopping that person moving forward, how do we then address that to give them the level of encouragement to address that fear to be able to move forward on that path and know that you've got their back yeah. Yeah. in some respects? Because that's a, I'd imagine that's a huge part of the, the relationship. Oh, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Absolutely, absolutely. And just to um, just to come back to one point, but just to reiterate a bit deep onto your point there, is that that's exactly the, the the result of our relationship. Because at the start of this year, when our uh, mentoring relationship took a hiatus, um, I realised very quickly that you taught me how to fish. Even at that point, even just before that hiatus came in, I, I probably still at some level saw you as a crutch. 
just at some level, even if it's just knowing if needed, you're there. You know, even a small crutch, a crutch at some level. Uh, and just so, when, when you say hiatus, let's just you know, be you know, frank with the viewers here. You know, I went to jail for six months. Yeah. Right? <laughs> uh, as a civil prisoner. And you know, right in the middle of a relationship where mm. you know, we were there, and all of a sudden life takes me out of the way for Keep contempt of court. And one of the most empowering things I actually got uh, as a letter in, in the first couple of weeks was from Nick saying, I didn't realize until I'd been taken out of that relationship mm. that you know, I taught you how to fish rather than mm. you know, provided you a fish. Yeah. Uh, and that, that, was, you know, that was very heartwarming, especially in a tiny little room at the time. Yeah, I, bet, I, I hope it was, and I'm delighted to hear that it was. Uh, and this, this is exactly it, because it was that whole thing of showing me, and, and here's the where I find as well that I, I've learned from you as a, as a mentor, is a lot of the lessons you teach me are non-verbal. You know, you, mm. you, you, you teach by example, you teach by doing very, very well. Sometimes what not to do, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Those but lessons are equally valuable. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> yes. And we'll come on to that point in a second, but yeah, carry Yeah, on. those lessons are equally valuable. But you taught me that, and it was, you know, when, when obviously the, the day came and, and, and you went inside, as they say, um, there was an immediate pang of shock, obviously. Uh, I don't think hey, me too. I don't think any of us expected that to happen. <laughs> Just like, wow, okay, so that's happened. And then everything started to lay in, like, okay, like, I've... And you've got to remember that my venture with you was my first venture into entrepreneurship. Before that, I'd been, you know, sitting on the perceived security that my career was giving me, perceived certainty my career was giving me. So I'd never had to be entrepreneurial without you by my side, hmm. you understand. So then when you went, and what went with it was my revenue stream into my business, because I was your sales director and we'd built a team of 14 people working full time. It's, you know, when that then went in the moment, my, my entrepreneurship was tested. I had to create something, I had to come up with it, and within 72 hours I'd found new clients, I'd reshaped the business, I'd done everything. Brilliant. Now, was the skill set to do that there before you mentored me? Probably, but was the understanding that I could do it there before? Definitely not. You know, and, and, and you unlocked it. When I met you I was like a carpenter with this epic toolbox and had no idea how to use the tools. I think I said this to you in our very first meeting. Um, and, you know, you taught me how to use the tools that I had. And you make beautiful gift. furniture. And, uh, and I'm not saying that, you know, clearly the only reason I should have gone was to be able to provide you that opportunity. <laughs> I'd like to be able to say that, but no, one of the main reasons was for me to be on my own journey and learn some yeah. of the lessons I needed to learn, especially around my ego at the time. You know? and, and again, another great point here, guys, is the fact that, you know, we've got a, uh, a situation where uh, yeah, the mentors are not the big all and end all. You know, we're on our own journey. What you're seeing here is just, as I said, generations. Yeah, you've got Conrad who is learning from Nick, who's been learning from me, I've been learning from my mentors yeah, for many years. The journey never ends. Yeah, this is a progression, this is a pathway, this is a way of life, not, oh, like, it's not like finishing school and getting a certificate that somebody signs, oh, I'm done, right, no. Getting a certificate at school, if that's the path you take, is the beginning of the, <laughs> the next part of the journey called employment, yeah, or, or a career. So you know, we're, we're all still learning you know, our own you know, ways of moving forward. Mm -hmm. and, and what you said is, is a, a great, um, or, or sparked a great memory, because when I was six years old, I remember that uh, we were learning how to swim, and we had swimming lessons at school. And we're standing at the deep end, and the kids would jump in, and for those that couldn't swim, like myself at the time, the instructor had a, a long pole, and we'd be able to jump off the side into the six foot yeah, and mm. which now, thankfully, I can stand up in, but at the time was very deep. But we'd be able to grab the pole, and that gave us that little certainty, that little security. Mm. And I remember the guy in front of me was also a pole grabber, shall we say, and just as he jumped, the instructor took the stick away, and he fell straight in. And what happened? He didn't drown. Mm. He got up and he went to the side, just as he knew he could, and the instructor was very smart with that. Now, having seen that, I didn't clearly learn the lesson that he was going you know, to do that with me, right? But I jumped and the pole went away and I panicked as I fell in that water and then all of a sudden I realized that, well, hang on, I kind of do know what I'm doing here mm. and enough times. And that's, that's really, yeah, I mean, your, your pole was taking away uh, for six months. It was. And, <laughs> um, uh, and, and as a result, you realized that you could always swim. Mm. And you know, that's sometimes a, a situation that life will engineer. Whether it's, oh, I don't want my wife to leave me and you end up in a divorce. Mm. And you realize that, well, actually people aren't fragile. Actually, what I really needed at that time was to learn self-resilience so I don't go back into a codependent relationship mm. 
but now I can give more of me because I'm comfortable being that alone. And I think we've covered some great points here mm. uh, already. Um, uh, Conrad, any, any final thoughts you want to share on, on what we've said today? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> any final thoughts? I feel that the biggest thing that you can do is actually go and try to find a mentor, but don't really be attached to the mentor that you get. Mm. Even if this is just the book of life itself. Because I went to the Sage Business School, and I think as many viewers on your YouTube channel, and I, I wasn't like a diehard fan, I just watched a couple of videos and they really resonated with me. And I'm a YouTube junkie, <laughs> so I was watching a lot of different people, and there were a couple of people that stood out, and I'm like, I'm just going to contact them. I actually did contact one of the guys, and I, did, I, I was in contact with a guy from Canada that you actually know, Dan Locke. Mm. And I did some copywriting for him, and he did, did answered some of my questions for the email. So it was like, this is doable. I actually mm. can connect with people, so let's try with this Peter guy. <laughs> let's see what happens. And then, well, I just had a conversation with you when you were in Warsaw, and then I met Nick. And when we were in November here doing the trial office for the, for the Sage Business School, for the sales team, I still felt like it is just the path for me to connect with you. And when I was able to let go of it, mm. and it was thanks to you in many ways, because we facilitated this very just French-based mm. relationship, and right now we're just friends, mm. which is amazing. And it's not that we are not a mentor and a mentee, we are friends as well. Mm -hmm. So just don't be attached to the mentor that you get, because, again, I just couldn't have engineered this path better than, I could, uh, that, that it happened, actually, than it actually mm. happened. And considering that right now, the three of us are sitting here, and we also had the opportunity to talk a lot of times. We shot some videos yesterday when you taught mm. me different things, and it was just hands-on teaching. I'm actually at the destination that I set out to be in, but now I'm so much more ready to actually get more out of it. Mm. So I feel that's, that's what, what is the most important thing. Excellent. Wonderful. Well, I think we could probably chat for another hour here, guys. So I'll probably um, shoot another couple of uh, videos at some point for the guys. Mm -hmm. Hope that's been useful, guys. Again, just want to give you some insight and perspectives here on the whole dynamic of mentorship. Yeah, some of the key takeaways there, as Conrad said, don't be attached to the mentor. If you're looking to get a mentor, you know, don't come at it from a, a sort of inferior, superior frame. You know, trust the universe, set your intention, come at it from a place of you wanting to add value to the relationship as much as wanting to be able to try and you know, take something uh, oh, yes. for yourself from the relationship as well. And you know, really be open to the fact that your ego is probably your biggest enemy when it comes to a, a mentorship relationship for you either judging the content what's coming back or defending where you're at or you know, essentially you know, really just preventing you from becoming the, the person who the mentor I'm sure will already recognize is that great person inside. So, you know, again, we could go into lots more tips, but I, I think for now it's been a, an incredible little journey for us. Uh, thank you guys so much for taking time to come out today. And um, yeah, stay tuned for some, uh, some more insights.